Good morning, everybody. It's Friday, April 19th. This is Amuse News. I'm your host, RJ. Um, I am uh, really excited to be here today. We have a, a kind of a two-part episode today. So you're going to hear me go through a couple news items, as I always do um, now. And then at 12 o'clock today, I'm going to be um, talking to my friend Maggie Rose um, as a like separate little short interview. But um, today I'm going to be, as I said, giving you the news. And then I'm going to be talking to Capri Cafaro, who has a new show on PBS called America the Bountiful, which is which is really cool. And um, she also has a podcast on HRN. So we're going to be talking to Capri in a couple minutes. I just wanted to run through a few, few news items, as always. Um, and I guess, well, let me tell you quickly. I'll tell you about this show that that Capri is hosting, America the Bonifil. So just so you can stick around after the news and, and hear about it. So the show's described as uh, shining a spotlight on the vibrant, untold food stories hidden in rural and small town America. So it's uh, it, I've watched a couple episodes, and Capri is traveling around to the American heartland. Um, she's from Ohio, like I am, um, and she is exploring the personal, emotionally moving chronicles of farmers, artisan, restaurateurs, and home cooks through the fair that they grow, produce, and eat. So it's going to be a really fun conversation. You should check out the show. It's on PBS, um, but you can also check it out streaming. So um, stay tuned for that in a second. So as you probably know, for each of these episodes, I want to bring you a couple pieces of news that are happening in the food world. There's a lot going on out there. And um, if you think I should be talking about something that I haven't talked about, please hit us up on social or send me a message. Most of you all know where to find me. It's a big day. We have a new Taylor Swift record. Uh, the NBA playoffs are starting. Fish is at the sphere. If you know what that means, then you know you know what that means. But if you don't, that's fine too. Um, okay, first thing I want to tell you about a newsletter I've been reading called the Food Section, um, which is it's really fun. Hannah Reskin, uh, she has a bunch of great content on there. Um, you can check that out at thefoodsection.com. But um, she sent out a newsletter today with food uh, and drink picks from some of the bureau chiefs that she works with. So we get some really cool insight into some restaurants and and bars and and uh, other purveyors in Nashville, Baton Rouge, West Virginia, and Charleston. Um, and there's just a lot of really cool and interesting writing about food on the food section. So you should check that out. Um, really good podcast. If you, if you all know the Good Food Podcast, um, you might you might know this already, but um, there, there's a new episode of the Good Food Podcast, which has a bunch of segments, which are all really interesting. Um, there's a, a journalist, activist, and, and founder of the blog, Gaza Mom, um, Lila El Haddad, who discusses how she's trying to keep the cuisine of Gaza alive as she tries to find solace during Ramadan. Really interesting conversation. Um, there is a conversation with a uh, a chef who um, has two vegan barbecue and food and soul food trucks, um, which is really interesting. And then there's there's a conversation about pie. Uh, anyway, great, great episode and really good podcast. Um, I saw this article yesterday from the Food Institute about the all night diner dying. Uh, which was really sad news. If if you're a live music person like I am, there sometimes you just need a, an all night diner after a after a show, and it's getting harder to find. Um, apparently, it's fallen probably 20% since 2020, partially the pandemic, but also higher cost and fewer workers. Um, so if you if you need that late night diner, um, I was in Nashville uh, seeing a show last year, and it was very hard to find a place to get food at at midnight. So I guess I, I've experienced that, but um, you might have to look a little, a little harder for those. Um, it is Earth uh, Day on Monday, and uh, the Marine the Marine Stewardship Council they are uh, publicizing this month um, Earth Month, and they're they're using a a blue fish label, which was developed to help all of us easily find seafood that meets the world's leading standards for sustainable fishing. Um, it comes it comes that means it comes from an MSC certified wild capture fishery. Uh, the hashtag Choose Blue um, you might see on social. And, um, if you buy products with the MSC blue fish label, you help support MSC certified fisheries. And I'm actually going to a dinner tonight in Philadelphia, highlighting sustainable seafood, um, brought, put on by MSC. And I'll absolutely report back because from what I can see, it's going to be awesome. You can check them out at msc.org doing work to, to help support sustainable fisheries. And then lastly, um, I think food and wine just had to do this because tomorrow is, is 420. They, revisited an article from 2015 and a study from Nature in 2015 talking about why cannabis makes you hungry. And there actually are chemical reasons um, and and they're kind of detailed in this story, which is in the show notes. Um, you can check that out. But 
Um, cannabis activates the receptor CB1, which is found throughout the body and alerts it to release hunger promoting hormones. So through this, uh, this study that was in nature in 2015, um, they explained that even if you had dinner and, and you smoke pot, all of a sudden, all these neurons that told you to stop eating become the drivers of hunger. Um, and, and of course this is all like fun and funny for still after all these years, the, uh, the cannabis puns keep coming, but of course there are uh, real world help for people, um, people getting their appetite back from chemotherapy and all kinds of things that medical uses. So it was a good, good article, but um, you know, just in time for 420 tomorrow. So that's my quick rundown of the news. Um, I think I'm going to bring Capri on now to talk about the show. Hey, Capri. Hey, hey, how's it going? It's going great. It's going great. How is it today in Ohio? Uh, overcast. You know, we had a couple of tornadoes, as a matter of fact, earlier in the week. It's a little early for tornado season, but that has obviously changed. I feel like I, I blame climate change for that. But so it's, you know, <clears throat> it's been a little crazy. Uh, we barely missed a big tornado. Well, not big, but a tornado coming through right near us um, on, on Wednesday. But you know, dodge the bullet, all is good. And, you know, I have to say, I know I'm here to talk about America the Bountiful, but knowing that you're a music person, I now just want to talk about music because that is my <laughs> other love in life is music. And I like have concert, will travel. I will travel like the earth for things um, when it comes to, you know, bands and live music. So if you ever want me back to talk about tunes, you know, well, listen, what's your last, what's the last best concert? You've the la well, I, I saw, well, I, I, saw two things. I saw back to back. I saw the Chemical Brothers, who I had not seen since um, 2001 in a warehouse in Washington, D.C. Uh, and then I saw the last kind of hurrah for the Teenage Cancer Trust series that Roger Daltrey from The Who um, has been putting on for the last 24 years. Both of these were at Royal Albert Hall. Um, back to back, one was Saturday, one was Sunday, and the one at the the Teenage Cancer Trust one was just like legendary. It was literally Robert Plant, Paul Weller from the Jam, Roger Daltrey, um, and a, and a bunch of other like British people that you might not necessarily know. Kelly Jones from the Stereophonics. Uh, it, it was v it, very, very, very cool, um, and for That's a great really cause cool. too. That's awesome. When was that? Was that recently, or was that that was about a month ago? Awesome. That's great. Yeah. What's um I, I really hate when people ask me this question, but I'll ask you anyway. Do you have like a favorite concert memory? Oh gosh. Yeah. I mean, uh Faith No More Rock on Send 2009. Wow. Faith No Faith No More it, only to be potentially eclipsed by Hyde Park 2014, Motorhead's uh Soundgarden, Faith No More and Black Sabbath. Wow. That yeah. is awesome. And, awesome. and yeah, I mean, so as you can tell, I have, I definitely, I would say I have a type of music, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah. At, at the same time, you know, the chemical brothers don't fit in. Like I, I have a weird soft spot for like, you know, George Michael and Simply Red. Um, I love Dr. Dre and Snoop. I'm a West coast rap girl from the nineties. So I'm, I, I do have eclectic and I love my soft station. will bring me some Sills and Croft any day of the week. So that is, that's so awesome to hear. We did not, we did not talk about this beforehand. So, but I love <laughs> it. Also, it sounds like you sound like a fish fan. You're like my favorite, my favorite show was this fish show from 1997 or a fish show from 1999 or the fish show I just saw, you know, it's kind of like you get it's into true. it. It's true. It's true. My one final closing thing on this is I fu funnily enough do not like jam bands, mm -hmm. but I love prog rock. So I, I love, yes. Mm -hmm. And and I will sit there and listen to like, you know, Chris Squire's 22 minute, like, you know, bass solo. And somehow that's okay to me or like Jethro <laughs> Tull, but like, I can't get, I, I can't get into fish or, or at, you know, or the, or the dead or like DMB, Dave Matthews. I like them, but I'm not like in it in the same way yeah. that like, you know, folks that are in it are in it. Which is interesting because as you'd like, as you alluded to, like the, the, the prog rock and jam <laughs> genres have a lot of overlap. Yep. Right, especially in terms of yeah, long solos and 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 in the way and song structure and all that. Okay, absolutely. We could, anyway, we could talk about this for a lot longer. <laughs> we really could. Um, so Capri, you you've been um, hosting a, a show, a, a, an audio show on HRN for a while called Eat Your Heartland Out, and now so this America the Bountiful, which I kind of described a little bit earlier, it's it's a new TV series, and I got to check out a couple episodes. It's really cool, and I I'm just curious where where this came from and how long this has been in the works? 
Well, um, it's I think it's been sort of in my head for probably a decade. Um, I, and, it, and it really was inspired, frankly, by being in northeastern Ohio um, and, you know, recognizing kind of the uh, the role that food and culture play in my backyard. Um, so you may be, you know, aware of this as growing up in Ohio and a lot of folks throughout the quote heartland probably also realize that summer times in particular are, are really driven by fairs and festivals, right? So not just your county fairs and your state fairs and that sort of thing, but, you know, your, in my case, the Geneva Grape Jamboree and the Hearts, the, you know, the Huntsburg Pumpkin Festival and, and then like a million Italian fests and Greek fests and Croatian fests and pierogi dash and all these sort of things. We also have on the north coast of Lake Erie, uh, you know, a, a burgeoning wine country, which draws in a lot of tourism. We uh, have the fourth largest Amish settlement in the world here, Middlefield in Northeast Ohio, which has its own culinary culture and draw. And so I thought to myself, if this is what we have in my little corner of Northeastern Ohio, um, all these kind of things that not only bring community together, but, you know, I, I think educate and inform uh, others about different cultures. What else is is out there in the world in the in the United States that does the same thing? How you know? So I kind of sought out to try to tell America's story through food, our immigration story, our migration story, um, and doing it in a way where we're kind of choosing one food, one crop, however you want to describe it, as that guide through an individual state. Uh, and uh, Eat Your Heartland Out was kind of part of this. And when I had this initial concept, I kind of thought that, you know, there'd be more of this like tourism type of uh, programming that would be the TV side. And Eat Your Heartland Out would be more of like the deeper nerd like dive. It didn't totally end up that way, but what it has, it, they, they're they very, very complementary um, as far as content is concerned. Eat Your Heartland Out focuses specifically on the intersection of food and culture in the American Midwest. Sometimes we deviate from the actual geographic boundaries of that um, because I can. you can make some real arguments on what is culturally Midwestern in places like Erie, Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, Buffalo, New York, and, yeah. and even in the mountain states. Um, but, you know, uh, we do a lot of different things on Eat Your Heartland Out, whereas we, you know, we take individual states and we, you know, use a food to be our tour guide. Um, so it really is history and travel um, using, you know, and, and with food as, as you know, the, the guide and all of it. So I guess I'm just going to go back quickly because may, people might not know. You've had like an amazing, like a, almost unbelievable series of careers <laughs> leading <laughs> you to where you are. You've been like, you've been, I mean, you've done everything. How How are you bridging Particularly, like your you were a, a Ohio State senator, yep. so and you were a political commentator on TV, and you've done cooking shows, and and I mean, it's amazing how how you've kind of bridged that. Is this like a a bridge between all of that in a way? Because I think the way you talk about culture and food, political stuff is not you know issue related, of course, but. I don't know. I'm just curious how that experience has maybe traveling around and talking to people probably like throughout that yep. time. But I'm just curious how that experience crosses over because they're very different, but I guess maybe more similar than we might think. You're absolutely right. And I will say that political commentary has nothing to do with what I do now and, and with good reason. Um, yeah. You know, the only thing, the only transferable skill there is being in front of a camera, um, you know, in that sense. But, um, you know, there is a lot now. Well, obviously, none of the content I do has any kind of political anything. So I want to be clear mm -hmm. about that, particularly mm -hmm. since this is a nonprofit media yes. organization and public television as well. There's nothing political about what I do. And again, with good reason. However, it is about people. And ultimately that's what public service is about. At least that was what it was about for me. And so you are right. I mean, what I just described to you was really informed by my 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 time in public service specifically, because if you're doing your job, you're going to every single community event. And, you know, I was going to every single community event in my, you know, radius. And, um, you know, really saw how it would bring people together. I also served on the Senate Agriculture Committee for, I think, seven, six or seven of my 10 years um, in office. So, uh, and I represented a, a pretty large agricultural community. I have urban, rural, and suburban communities that I represented. Um, but, you know, if you are going to be a good public servant, you spend a lot of time talking to people, as you alluded yeah. to. And, you know, people whose voices are often not heard. 
Um, and they want to be listened to and they deserve to be amplified. And I, I think I bring that core sensibility and objective to all of my work, ensuring that, you know, the content that I have is, is inclusive, that is, you know, shining a light on things that people wouldn't necessarily, you know, think that are kind of like, you know, myth busters of, of certain things, whether it's, you know, female farmers or female, you know, uh, you know, fisher women, crab women on, on, you know, uh, going out there and harvesting crabs in uh, the Chesapeake Bay. I mean, you name it from, from, uh, you know, the entire kind of perspective or uh, spectrum rather. Um, mm -hmm. And, and that does come, I think, from, from my heart in public service and a desire to, like I said, kind of amplify voices that, that may or may not be marginalized, but certainly you're not getting the you know, the attention or respect that they deserve. Um, and and that, I think, is is part of the objective of both Eat Your Heart Laid Out and America the Bountiful. Yeah, that's thanks for thanks for explaining that. And I, I think when you watch the show, you can feel that. I mean, I think the, the one that I saw was the um, most recently was the pears in Oregon. And I, I think it was just such a. Um, I guess on one hand, like that is kind of the the PBS approach, right? It's like it's personal. It's, it's like in depth, it's thoughtful, but you have these like very, very intimate, um, conversations with people who are talking about something that's like so near and dear to their hearts. Um, I, th I think it's really interesting and, and a different than any kind of, it's not celebrating, you know, like a celebrity chef or, or looking at like the most popular restaurant. It's really like going into, the weeds of like, you know, something that, but you can tell the people you're talking to are so passionate and so, you know, thoughtful about what they do. I, I think it's a really interesting look at, at food that I, I think is sort of different. So I, I don't know, curious, like, is that, what, what were you trying to achieve when you go to like film and, and was it different from other stuff you've done in terms of pre-production and how you prep for these things? Well, I, you know, first I'll say, this is why it's public television and not you know, uh, you know, a sort of run of the mill network that you would think mm -hmm. of, um, you know, because it isn't, you know, just a straight up travel show where you're running around, and you're like, check this out, like, it's kitschy, or it's this or it's yummy. And we do, we do have that um, in the mix. But it really is about getting those stories. And um, so, again, my, my approach to this, to the research I do for America the Bountiful and Eat Your Heartland Out are somewhat similar. Um, you know, trying to come up with themes. And I, I'm always kind of trying to dig deep and, and find unique stories that I think might break. Both are, I think, reflective of that regional culture, but also may break the mold of what people might think um, is, you know, the obvious situation that might happen. Again, using Maryland as the example. Okay, we all know about Maryland crabs, but would you expect a all-female crabbing crew you know, and so in that sense, you know, we're, we are, we are looking and it's, it's a, it's a multi-tiered process. So I do research on, you know, well, first we figure out, you know, what do we want to choose as that particular, you know, food for the guide. And, you know, some of it is obvious, like maple in Vermont. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of it, I refuse to be, if there is an alternative, I'm like, I am not doing peaches in Georgia. I'm doing pecans in Georgia because that is something that is different. In some of the larger states, as we are getting into season two and looking at places like California and Florida, where you have a number of different things, you have to really sort of, get, and they're such big states, um, you know, what, what, how do we want to approach it? And so I kind of, we've had like a short list of, you know, like in in California, we're looking at, you know, avocados, olives, um, uh, garlic, and pistachios. And so you have to take a bunch of things into consideration. What's in season? Like, how can we plug it into everything else? Because this this filming season is very summer top heavy. So mm -hmm. in order to not be like literally permanently on the road, how can we like, you know, if places like California and Florida, they might have longer growing seasons for certain things. So we have some practical aspects, but then we're looking for what's a better story as well, you know, if there's a lot of different, you know, different crops, what is really going to be a more insightful, thoughtful thing, maybe that people haven't talked about before, and then getting into identifying, you know, I, I'm always looking for like multi-generational family farmers, um, you know, uh, restaurants or, you know, food um, purveyors that are doing something unique with the product in some way, um, showing that if there's a new application to something that has been grown for, you know, you know, centuries or 
you know, whatever. Um, and, and then we're always trying to, to bring in a little bit of fun. So we try to, you know, incorporate maybe a festival if we can, or, you know, a, a, a fun, you know, diner, somebody that's doing something totally crazy um, with the food. Like, you know, there was this maple concoction that literally was like, a maple soft serve with maple uh, candy, um, cotton candy coming out of it and stuff like that. So, you know, we have to, we, we try to like have this kind of balance of, you know, uh, a trajectory of kind of, this is where it comes from that, you know, this is its historical cultural significance. These are the people that are making it, growing it. These are, these are some of the ways that it's being used now, um, you know, in different kinds of applications like you saw, for example, Perry, right? The yeah. the liqueur and, and the pear episode, yeah. Yeah. Um, which is kind of different. And then here's how somebody is doing it. Like, again, using the pear episode, multi-generational family farm, they decided they wanted to do, you know, agritourism and they have this, you know, lovely, you know, pear pizzas. And so, you know, we kind of try to put all of these different types of elements together in the show. That's, that's great. Um, and I, yeah, that, that, the kind of, uh, expanding the farm it reminded me of some of the wineries in like in northern california where you go yeah. and it's like you know you don't just get the wine you get like an experience which i think is is really cool and it's nice to see these different um profiles of, of people who are again taking what they do so so seriously you know um what what was what was it like just mostly out of curiosity creating a show for tv versus podcast i mean i know you've done tv before but like you know scripting yeah. and pre-production it's totally and... it's totally different and i have to say i have to give credit where credit is due um i work with an incredible production company out of minneapolis and wisconsin credo nonfiction jesse raisler who i featured on one of the more, more recent episodes of eat your heartland out um and we you know uh, as i started to i had this concept and i actually was writing some uh some articles for the Food Network um, website and and talk to their digital folks about, I have this idea, this and that. And they gave me a list of people to potentially talk to. And Credo Nonfiction actually was one that they had worked with um, uh, on the digital side. And we just totally connected off the bat. And um, so he and I worked together. They do most of, of the scripting side, certainly. But, you know, we'll both research. We compare notes. Um, you know, but when it comes to the actual script, um, you know, and logistics side, um, you know, they, they very much are part of that. I, I will say that, I mean, there's no, there's, even though I've done a lot of television, live TV, um, it's a very different skill set, very, very different. Um, you know, because you have to be kind of, you have to be ready for anything, but you, you do have some opportunity to, you know, um, shift things around and whatever, yeah. but you also are looking, you know, you're spending hours, days to put together something that's 27 minutes long. Um, and, and through that process though, and, and over the last year, year I, I remember distinctly, actually, I feel like it was like the, maybe the f 13 episodes a season, I think like se episode five maybe is when I felt like I was making a turning, like it was a turning point for me where I was m starting to get much more comfortable and understanding the other side, sort of the technical side of like, okay, I know that we need these cutaway shots and, you know, this should, like, we might want to think about doing this one and slower motion, which is like 60 versus 24. Like I've, I've learned all that wow. stuff. And obviously wow. we have a director on, on, yeah. on set, but you know, I will throw my like two cents in and my two cents are actually starting to become valuable. Mm -hmm. Um, and when we, when we had some folks that had COVID and we were kind of in a skeleton crew situation, I had to sort of ride, like rise to the occasion. And, and that actually was kind of when that turning point kind of happened because I was like, okay, what have I seen? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and look, this is, again, this is public television. We don't have an unlimited budget. Um, and I do want to thank American Farmland Trust, uh, as our, as our lead underwriter, um, for, for America, the Bountiful have been incredible partners, um, and, and really share a lot of, um, I think the same mission that we do. That's really cool. Yeah. I think, you know, I've, I've done a podcast for, I think 11 years now and, and we do live events sometimes and we'll, but every time I'm in a live event situation where there's video involved, I'm like, shit, there's so much to think about. And I can't even imagine like for some narrative stuff, you know, you're like, it's just such a more in-depth thing. It's not like you're sitting down to do an interview live. You're, you're, you know, you're creating a whole world that you have to, again, extract that small amount of content from. Right. And, and we know, I mean, we know going in, um, you know, so as part of, um, you know, the, the process again, you know, sort of, uh, 
you know, I, I certainly have my own questions, but we know from a story arc perspective, the folks at Credo, like make sure that, you know, they have like some sort of guideposts, if you will. So mm -hmm. to make sure that we kind of get the story arc that our objective is trying to meet. Um, and so we come into that knowing um, kind of the things that, you know, we want. But I will say that I, the way that we approach this and, and particularly Jesse as, as, as a director uh, and co-executive producer with me, like we don't try to over direct the people like we want them to talk. And I think that that is also where my public service skills come into this mm -hmm. because you, you people, because we do interview real people, right? And so real people aren't used to being in front of the camera. You need to make them feel comfortable. You want them to be at ease. You don't want them to be, you know, um, unnecessarily distracted. And so, you know, we don't want to be like over the top. I'm like, we want you to say this, like that is not what we do. Um, so we kind of let it go and, and flow, but you know, every now and again, we'll go back in and be like, you know, for whatever reason, there's an airplane overhead or whatever. Yeah. 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 You know, like, can you say that line again? Because it just is, is, you know, is what it is. Cause you are out in the wild. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. It's crazy. And I, I was, I was, I think like what I, the intimacy that I was referring to earlier, I think is interesting and surprising to some degree because you do have to get these people so comfortable. And I felt like everyone you talked to was so comfortable being on camera, which was, which was great to see because it just creates a much more authentic kind of picture of what they're talking about. I appreciate that. I'm glad that that's coming through. I, that is wonderful feedback. Um, what, where is the best place for people to, to check out the show? Uh, well, you obviously can check your local listings for, uh, you know, your public, local public television, PBS affiliates, um, PBS app, pbs.org, um, America, the bountiful show.com is our website. Um, and we continue to try to update, um, every week, new, more and more stations across the country. You know, we're getting close, we're getting closer, yeah, closer and closer into, into that, you know, 95, you know, percent number We're we're getting closer. We're up there. Um, and, uh, so I think we're like at 70 now, I don't know, but it doesn't really matter. Bottom line is, is that even if your local market doesn't have it, you can see it on the PBS app streaming, um, and PBS.org. You can also, if, because there's a partnership between PBS and Hulu live, you can see it on Hulu in the markets that have it on TV. Nice. Um, which is also cool. You can also follow us uh, at America the Bountiful on Instagram. So we'll, we'll keep you updated, uh, particularly on social. Um, on you know, we're, I'm going out in the field in literally like five days to start filming again. Um, we're going to tell the story of uh, Pennsylvania through mushrooms, um, and I'll be out there in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, next week. So that's um, so great. Yeah, you'll be very, very, very nearby. Very that's near right. Where I am. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, well, really cool. I can't wait to, to watch more. And thanks for coming on to share this with us. And, um, you know, we look forward to, to seeing more. Thanks so much. And I'm so proud to be part of the HRN family. So thanks again. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Capri. And everyone watching, thank you so much for tuning in. If you're listening to the podcast, hang on for one second, because I'm going to include an interview with Maggie Rose, amazing musician. Um, if you're watching live, we'll be back at 12 o'clock for that conversation. So come back in about an hour. But um, if you're listening, just hang on for a second. Thanks, everybody.